Doing the Black Girls with Queen, I wanted to give a shout out to Ring IQ Boxing and remember to tune in to the motherfucking relay. Welcome to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this per tweet from Michael Benson. Bob Arum was quoted as saying, Mandatory shmandatories. If Joshua is successful versus Pulev and Fury is successful versus Wilder, everybody will look at Fury and Joshua as the fight they want to see. They don't care about a mandatory, whether Usyk or White. Eddie Hearn tells you guys something different from what he tells me. If he wants to push Dillian White to fight the winner of Fury vs. Wilder 3 and to deprive Anthony Joshua of the tremendous revenue that would come from a Fury vs. Joshua fight, that's on Eddie. It's not a secret that there's a conflict of interest there for Eddie Hearn, as Eddie Hearn has worked to get Dillian White in a position to challenge Deontay Wilder. But it's gone from challenging Deontay Wilder to challenging Tyson Fury. The conflict of interest here is not everybody can get what they want. Dillian White wants to challenge the winner of Wilder vs. Fury 3. But the winner of Wilder vs. Fury 3, regardless of who it is, whether it's Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder, the winner of that fight will be in a pole position to enter into an undisputed heavyweight title fight, the likes of which the division hasn't seen in years. It's not that there's no value in a Dillian White fight, as Dillian White has amassed a following over there in the United Kingdom that is worth some revenue, enough revenue that an obscure heavyweight like Oscar Rivas was able to make over a million dollars just for fighting Dillian White. What kind of money a Dillian White fight gets you these days? So, just imagine if you tack on the name of a Tyson Fury. Fury versus White for the WBC heavyweight title. There is value in that match. Not as much as there is in a Joshua fight. But still considerably more value than most of what the heavyweight division has to offer. Dillian White is a marquee fighter. You won't make fighting Luis Ortiz what you'll make fighting Dillian White. You won't make fighting Dominic Brazil or Oscar Rivas, Adam Kovnowski, Robert Hellenius, any one of these guys. You don't make for those guys what you make for fighting Dillian White. So there is value in a White versus Fury situation that Bob Arum is refusing to acknowledge. I mean, if they view Dillian White in the same scope, the same spectrum as a Tom Schwartz or Renato Valine, Given the considerable value that a Dillian White fight presents, you'd think they'd be more open to that idea, as this is a mandatory obligation. Tyson Fury can't skirt around this guy without suffering the consequences. But he seems to want to. So he starts talking about Eddie Hearn, implying that Eddie Hearn is playing both sides of this thing, saying that Eddie Hearn tells you guys something different from what he tells me. Maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. The decision to push for this mandatory title shot, the decision to do it, doesn't actually rest with Eddie Hearn. It rests with Dillian White. Oh. Eddie Hearn, he ain't the one with the title shot. And the decision to follow through, push for it, force this title shot, doesn't rest with Eddie Hearn. It rests with Dillian White. Dillian White, who doesn't care about your plans or Eddie's. Why like bringing him up is irrelevant. I mean, maybe Eddie Hearn is playing both sides. I don't put it past him. There's certainly more money in a Joshua fight than there is a Dillian White fight if we're talking about Tyson Fury. So it's possible that Bob Arum's telling the truth, but even if he is, it's irrelevant to the conversation because it's Dillian White that's owed the title shot and it's Dillian White that wants it. It's Dillian White you have to deal with. Being flippant about it ain't gonna change that. You know, you could probably negotiate with Alexander Usyk. Step aside, a lot easier than you could Dillian White because Alexander hasn't been waiting for a title shot anywhere near as long as Dillian White has. Alexander just got to that weight class. So it's possible that maybe you could get that guy to step aside even though that's not what him and his team are saying. It's still more possible, more likely, than Dillian White doing that. Oh. Dillian White doesn't want to wait anymore. I can hardly blame him. If I'm being honest, I wouldn't mind seeing Dillian White get his title shot against the winner of Fury versus Wilder 3 before the undisputed heavyweight title fight goes down. Yeah, I don't got a problem with that. Well, some of you out there might take issue with Dillian White delaying the undisputed heavyweight title fight myself. The truth, I take no issue with it. I understand. Because if the guy really were a walk in the park like some people out there would have you believe, then Deontay Wilder would have took care of this guy a long time ago, but he didn't. And there's a reason for that. 
Here today, we're seeing Bob Arum be very flippant when it comes to Dillian White's overdue title shot, and the same applies. If it's easy, you didn't get it done. Because you'd certainly make more money fighting Dillian White than you did fighting Tom Schwartz, than you did fighting Otto Valine. How much money did you make off those fights? Do you think those fights are pay-per-view worthy? I'll tell you something. In the United Kingdom, Fury versus White is a marketable pay-per-view event. It is. That if and when it goes down, could pack out the O2 Arena. It's a big fight. It's not as big as a Joshua fight, but it's still a sizable fight. More sizable than either the Tom Schwartz fight was or the Otto Valine fight was. And you were okay to fight those guys. But for some reason, you got an aversion to fighting this guy. Why is that? Why is it that whenever the subject of Dillian White is broached, has been broached by either Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury, neither one of the two hesitate to call him a bum. Neither one of the two hesitate to call him a crash test dummy. But when it comes time to fight him, they choose to go the other way. Both of them did. And one of them still might. For the second time, I might add, I will admit that in a Dillian White versus Tyson Fury fight, Tyson Fury really would be the logical choice. I have no doubts that he would enter into that contest as the favorite. But how big a favorite is the question. I mean, perhaps he is the logical choice. I could see that. I could understand that hierarchy of thought, that reasoning. Of course. But it's enough of a gamble that they don't really want to know. They don't really want to find out that Perhaps they're somewhat confident that Fury wins that fight. Perhaps. But not so confident that they're going to throw caution to the wind and actually put him in there. If they viewed him in the same scope as an Otto Valine or a Tom Schwartz, there'd be that much more reason for them to make the fight because Dillian White, unlike those guys, can get you a multi-million dollar payday. So if it's easy, why wouldn't you take care of the guy? It's easy, right? Well, maybe they don't think it's as easy as they let on. Maybe that's not the scope they actually view Dillian White in. Maybe they think Tyson Fury can beat him, but they view him as enough of a threat that they won't take the chance. Not needlessly. That's why Bob Arum's cavalier demeanor towards the situation doesn't speak to the gravity of it. That you're sitting here talking about Eddie Hearn and how he might be double talking when whether he's double talking or not, he's not the guy you gotta worry about. You've got to worry about Dillian White. Cause he's the one you gotta answer to. Talk about Tyson, obviously the last time we saw him, brilliant performance against Wilder. Talk is that they're going to get that third fight on. Uh, Eddie did come out and say, forget the Wilder fight, let's make, it, let's make the Dylan White fight. Um, is that something that's realistic with, obviously we know Wilder deserves his third fight as a champion? Well, look, he's got a conflict of interest in as much that, you know, that, that's his guy to fight. Tyson's contracted to fight against, um, against Wilder and that fight we want to get it on this year. Tyson's not prepared to wait till next year for that. And the bottom line is uh, the real fight we want to see is him and is Tyson in the ring with AJ. That's, that's what everybody wants to see. All the other stuff is, is what it is. And, with, and obviously he's got a contractual obligation with uh, AJ with Pulev. So get their stuff out of the way this year and move to that. Uh, it'll be his decision who he wants to fight. You know, Tyson's not beholden to anybody. He's paid his dues. He's the lineal champion. He's, he's gone to other people's backyards and fought. So he'll do what he wants to do. Where does that Bob Arum said that they're going to push that fight over to next year with the crowd situation. And what can you give us on the latest? We know it's meant to be in so Vegas at the stadium. He's not going to wait till next year. He will fight this year. You know, he will not wait till next year. End of story. If it's not Wilder, who else could it be in December? I don't, I don't know where it's going to be, but he won't fight. You know, Tyson will fight this year. I mean, I spoke with him this morning. He's fighting this year. That's what he wants. And, uh, you know, we don't want the fight put back. Yeah. Uh, we want to try and get it on this year by hook or by crook. I don't even know that we should take into account anything Frank Warren has to say, as his role in Tyson Fury's career has to have been minimized by now. I mean, Tyson Fury's not a UK-based fighter. He's a USA-based fighter. That's why, according to Eddie Hearn, he doesn't even have to deal with Frank in order to orchestrate the Joshua versus Fury fight. The guy he's got to go through is Bob. Yet here we have Frank Warren stating quite plainly that Tyson Fury means to fight at some point in 2020 before the year is out with or without Deontay Wilder. And if the Wilder fight gets pushed back to 2021 for Tyson Fury, the show must go on. So is it going to be Dillian White? Well, you guys heard that soundbite. Frank Warren didn't give any definitive answers as far as who would Tyson Fury be fighting, if not Wilder, before the year is out. It's still in the air what this guy plans on doing, and I'm wondering how much stock we should even have in these comments when Frank... He's not in the picture as much as he used to be. But while he's not cut out completely, his role in Tyson Fury's career at this point has been minimized. 
Tyson Fury's not fighting in the United Kingdom. He's fighting in the United States. He's primarily fighting in the United States. In that situation, in that scenario, what the hell can Frank do for him? I don't doubt that perhaps Frank still benefits in some way, shape, or form from Tyson Fury's continued success financially. Maybe he's getting something, some small piece of the pie when it comes to what Tyson Fury brings in. I don't doubt that for a second. Perhaps he does. I don't doubt that he's still in the loop. He's still in the know that he is maintaining communications with Tyson Fury, but as far as any actual decision making in Tyson Fury's career... A major role. Yeah, I just don't see how that would work. I don't know what service Frank could provide for Fury when Fury's doing all his fighting here stateside. Now, I don't know, outside of getting Fury's fights here on BT Sport, who Frank works for, he's got to deal with. Beyond that, what could Frank possibly be doing for this guy? He's busy staging cards for, for Lyndon Arthur and Archie Sharp and Anthony Yard, those guys. Those guys who you don't see making any appearances on Tyson Fury's undercards, right? So I do question the validity of what Frank Warren is saying. I question how much stock we should have in it. That if Tyson Fury means to return to the ring sometime before the year is out, with or without Deontay Wilder, who's it going to be against? Is he going to use that as an opportunity to get Dillian White out of the way in a show that could happen behind closed doors? I don't know. Or... Is he looking to fight someone else entirely? And how would that kind of a situation go over with WBC and Dillian White and Eddie Hine and everybody else? Tyson Fury does do what he wants. But free will in and of itself doesn't mean you're free of consequence. It's always a consequence to every action. There is an equal and opposing reaction. Is Tyson Fury actually at liberty to have some kind of interim fight that doesn't involve Deontay Wilder and... Doesn't involve Dillian White? Is he actually free to do that without consequence? So much of this situation that requires reconciliation has been delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic, but what it hasn't been is reconciled. There's still more work needs doing. Lots more. You must satisfy your obligation, your contractual obligation to Deontay Wilder, but at the same time, you've got to satisfy your Mandatory. obligations as a champion, as a belt holder. That is, unless you're prepared to relinquish that belt and give it up. By now, it's pretty obvious that Bob Arum is determined to wait for crowds to come back before they stage the Wilder vs. Fury rubber match. But in truth, we don't know how long that's going to be. We don't know how long that's going to take. And if it takes as long as February 2021 and beyond... They're gonna sit out that whole time? Both Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury? If I'm being honest, I'm not all that enthusiastic to see a third fight. I'm not all that excited about it. And there are those out there who feel that Wilder is owed this opportunity, not just because of the contractual element of it, but because he was a champion yeah. and he should get a chance to win his belt back. I understand those people, I just don't share their perspective. We've been here two times already, and at this point, this is a hindrance, an obstacle that is further preventing us from getting that undisputed heavyweight title fight. You've already got the Dillian White situation to reconcile, but you also have this. But when it comes to this, we've seen this two times already. Causing a lot of problems. Contract is a legally binding contract nonetheless. So regardless of what I think about it or what you think about it, Tyson Fury is put in a situation to where he must oblige Deontay Wilder at Deontay Wilder's request. And Wilder has exercised that rematch clause, so it is what it is. We ain't gotta like it. But it does make this situation a lot messier, a lot more convoluted, a lot more drug out than this fight fan would like. And like all things with Tyson Fury, you're never quite sure what's going to happen next. Based on what Frank is saying, and what Bob is saying, and what's going on around the world, and Dillian White, and Deontay Wilder, and the Joshua fight, you just don't know what the next chapter is going to be. And Frank's recent set of comments, they just make things that much more confusing. And finally, just in keeping with the theme of all things Bob, some capacity, Bob Arum told Ock and Barack it's very difficult to understand what Ryan Garcia is complaining about. Garcia's advisor, Guadalupe Valencia, fired back and said he should worry about getting Crawford a decent opponent and paying Teofimo a fair purse and stop worrying about Garcia. Valencia didn't pull any punches on Bob, though, if we're being honest, Crawford's situation not being able to get the kind of opponents that he wants, the kind of opponents that would make for a big fight, big marquee event. That's not actually Bob Arum's fault. I mean, 
if most of the welterweight talent is on the other side of the street and the other side of the street ain't really willing to work with you when it comes to that, what the hell can Bob do in that situation? Not a lot. Comes to Teofimo. That's being ironed out as we speak. And we will discuss that in another video. Essentially, what Guadalupe Valencia is doing is deflecting. It's a deflection. That's what it is. I mean, no matter what difficulties Bob Arum may be experiencing right here and now, that doesn't take away from the fact that he's making a valid point. It shouldn't be that difficult to make a fight for a kid who's little more than just a prospect. He's not a world champion or an interim champion. Nothing of the sort. There's always a fucking problem with this kid. And we talked about in my previous video how Eddie Hearn has tentative plans to perhaps stage that Ryan Garcia versus Luke Campbell fight over there in the United Kingdom. But those are very immaterial plans here and now. We don't know how far along they actually are in those plans and whether or not they'll actually come into fruition. They might not. But this isn't a mega fight, you understand. This is your run-of-the-mill, step-up in competition, coming-of-age fight that most every single fighter that is an elite-level fighter must go through. I mean, you're telling me that you've got to go through this whole fucking ordeal to orchestrate a fight with a guy that Ivan Mendy beat? Huh? That Jorge Linares beat? That Vasil Lomachenko just beat? Huh? You've got to go through all this just to orchestrate a fight with that guy? What the hell are you afraid of? Hey, listen, I got nothing against Luke Campbell. I actually have a high opinion of that kid. I think he's a solid fighter. I think he brings something to the table. And I think it's a fight worth watching, a fight worth making. But it shouldn't be taking this long. And if it is taking this long, newsflash, it ain't because of Luke Campbell. It's because the Ryan Garcia people are once again dragging their feet. I understand negotiating on your own behalf, and I understand looking out for your own best interest because nobody's going to look out for you better than you are. I get it. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, and I understand that. But even in that realm, there is a line. I mean, are you really being reasonable? What do you want them to pay you just to fight Luke Campbell? This is happening every other fucking fight. Yeah, these kind of issues didn't start here and now. With Luke, this is what's been going on. And these continued issues that Ryan keeps having ahead of these fights paint a picture to where you start to wonder, does this kid actually want to get in the ring? Does he really want to be the best? Because every time he's got to fight somebody, there's some kind of fucking problem. Look, I'm pretty sure Eddie Hines got the kind of money that Ryan Garcia and his people are looking for, and in all likelihood, he'll put it up. And the fight will get made. But there's still something to be said about how hard it was to make as a result of Ryan Garcia's demands. He's a prima donna. 